Hello, I'm Pastor Hilly. Thank you for joining us for Faith Lutheran Church's Adult Forum series. This episode is about festivals and commemorations in our church year. But before we get there, a brief reminder that during this time of social distancing, there is wonderful ministry coming out of the community that we call Faith Lutheran Church here in Whitehall, Ohio. Ministry that includes this very podcast. If you would like to support the Ministry of Faith financially, please see the link labeled Giving in the description below. And now, on to the episode. So, here's a question. What do Martin Luther, the 16th century monk, Martin Luther King Jr., the 20th century African-American civil rights activist and, and preacher, the name of Jesus the festival, and Polycarp all have in common. And the thing is, they are all remembered as part of the sanctoral cycle of the church year. And the sanctoral cycle is what we're going to be talking about today. What is it? Do we use that or acknowledge that as Lutherans? These are all really good questions, and hopefully we'll touch on all of the answers. But first, I'd like to share some words written inside of the dust jacket of a book titled Festivals and Commemorations, Handbook to the Calendar in Lutheran Book of Worship. Um, this book uh, came out right around the time that the Lutheran Book of Worship, the green uh, hymnal that came out in 1978, was printed. This was a companion to it that has all of the festivals, commemorations, and other observances uh, that are part of that sanctoral cycle as a way to not make the actual green hymn book huge and cumbersome. Uh, this this text is about 470 pages. It has uh, all these commemorations and festivals in it, as well as readings and prayers specifically prescribed, subscribed uh, to those days. And so here is uh, what it says on the dust jacket. The Christian calendar consists of two parts or cycles. The temporal cycle runs from Advent through Pentecost and commemorates the redemptive acts of God who in Christ reconciled the world to himself. The sanctoral cycle commemorates various outstanding examples of the Christian faith. The observance of both cycles of the calendar together ensures that the acts of God will be related to individual everyday life. And that ordinary life will be seen as capable of proclaiming the gospel. So the gospel is brought down to daily living and daily living becomes the work of the gospel. The calendar of commemorations is a kind of genealogical exploration of spiritual ancestors. It is a way of encouraging people to examine the personal stories of certain women and men to learn of the richness and the potential of human life lived by the grace of God. A study of the calendar is at once a course in theology, church history, spirituality, and prayer. Again, that is the uh, dust jacket for this book, Festivals and Commemoration, Handbook to the Calendar in Lutheran Book of Worship by Philip H. Uh, Fadicher. One of those last names you look at and shudder a little bit. Too many, uh, too many silent uh, consonants or so in his name. I'll put a uh, link to that book on Amazon in the description of this video. But just what a, a wonderful description of the church calendar being broken into two parts or two cycles the temporal cycle and then um the sanctoral cycle 
And, and the time cycle, Advent through Pentecost, through the six seasons, takes us through those, uh, I always like to refer to it as Jesus Christ's greatest hits. It starts us at Advent and gets us to Pentecost. Whereas the, the sanctoral cycle, which runs parallel, kind of gives us the, these deep cuts of exemplars of the faith uh, to show us that the power of God and the power of the gospel touches and is exhibited in our everyday lives and in turn our everyday lives are testaments to the power of the gospel and so what this book is is it's an exhaustive list of the festivals and commemoration um, for the sanctoral cycle and some of those festivals and commemorations for for example the uh, festival of the reformation that was listed in the lbw um, However, there are a lot of other uh, commemorations we're going to touch on a few in this podcast that they just didn't have the time or not the time. They didn't have the space in the LBW to put all those commemorations. And so, I, you know, the LBW, the Lutheran Book of Worship, came out in 1978. The new book, the Cranberry Book the, uh, that we currently use, uh, came out in 2006. Uh, and with just like in the LBW, which is a shorthand for Lutheran Book of Worship, the um, ELW, which is a shorthand for the current Evangelical Lutheran Worship, the Cranberry Hymn Book, um, in the ELW, there is a list of lesser festivals that can be found in your pew hymnal, pages 54 through 58. However, what this book provides is much more information, like I said, writings, prayers, and other colics uh, to be used to celebrate these worship orders, or to, to celebrate these commemorations during worship. Um, so, why are these festivals and commemorations important? I, I love the phrase that I just read, it's a genealogical exploration of spiritual ancestors. These people who we're going to be talking about, they uh, provided in this book, there are these short snapshots of these people living out their faith uh, in a way that underlines the power of God. And again, in turn, shows us all that the power of God can shine through us as individuals in our everyday lives. It shows us this power and testimony of the great cloud of witnesses that we enter into through the waters of baptism. That great cloud of witnesses that we join every time we approach the communion rail. That great cloud of witnesses from which we can draw strength in those moments of feeling isolated and lonely. We know that we are part of this great group of believers uh, across time and being able to be reminded of, to, for lack of a better phrase, who's on your team or other people who have done, um, who have experienced these really high highs and lows, lows, and God has walked through. Um, we can uh, we can find a lot of comfort in that. I, I grew up in North Carolina, and one of my favorite things, when Wikipedia first kind of took off uh, on the internet, you know, years ago, was I would love to go to Wikipedia and type in famous people from North Carolina, because I grew up in North Carolina. Uh, and it meant a lot to be like, oh man, all, all these people came from the same place I did. I think that there's a similarity. It's not a one-to-one -one comparison, but there's a similarity to be like, all right, as people of faith, these are other people of faith uh, who have persevered and they stayed the course and they ran the race. Uh, and there, there's a lot of comfort in that. So as we look to the week ahead, the week ahead, um, this coming Sunday is April 19th. So we're talking the seven days after that. In the week ahead, we have four commemorations and one festival. So I thought, why not talk about these wonderful examples of faith in history now so we can all take our pencils and write them in on our calendar, and that way when their day comes, when their commemoration day comes, we can all go, oh yeah, this is, uh, this is that day, and we can all know a little more about kind of the deep cuts of people of faith in our tradition, or I, I should say within Christianity. Um, so we're going to start in Sweden in the 16th century, because this Sunday, 
April 19th is the commemoration of Olvis Petrie, who is a priest, and his brother Laronidas Petrie, who was the Archbishop of Uppsala, U-P-P-S-A-L-A. -A. Uh, those of you with Swedish background will uh, please correct me, leave a, leave a note in the uh, comments below. And these two brothers, Olveus and uh, Laronidas, uh, they are commemorated as being renewers of the church. They are uh, this set of brothers who were more or less the lead of the Reformation movement in Sweden. Uh, their education, uh, both went through uh, Uppsala, then they studied at Leipzig, and then they went down to Wittenberg. They both put in time at Wittenberg. There's a little age difference between the two. Uh, Olvis was in Wittenberg, uh, they think, when Luther posted the 95 Theses. And the way that they believe that is Olvis, uh, he received his degree at Wittenberg in 1516, and Luther posted the 95 Theses in 1517. And so the idea is after he completed his education, he was probably in town uh, for up to a year uh, doing extra courses of study or working or uh, engaging in various ways. So let's talk about Olvis first. Olvis wrote extensively uh, to give an intellectual and liturgical basis for the education of clergy in Sweden. Because Olvis knew that if the Reformation in Sweden was going to catch on, if the Reformation in Sweden was going to get legs under it and really move forward, then there needed to be a strong educational and liturgical basis for the clergy who were doing the work of the church through the various uh, provinces or territories or, or areas. Because if you have a clergy base who are making things up on their own, then there's going to be a lot of discrepancy and a lot of variance and that sort of thing. However, if all of your clergy are educated in both theology and liturgy and are coming from the same point, it gives much more consistency to the faith throughout the entire country. This is, uh, in an offhanded way, it reminds me of the story of the Apostles' Creed, which the uh, old story is that the Twelve Apostles sat down and everybody said one sentence and the 12 sentences they said are the 12 lines of the Apostles' Creed. And they wrote that so that the Apostles could teach their disciples and that whenever anybody asked a question about what do Christians believe, all they had to do was recite the Apostles' Creed and they would all be saying the same thing. So uh, in, in Olvis's writing, it's kind of a similar idea. He wrote extensively about liturgy and education for the clergy to put them on the same, um, same page. And thus, because he wrote so much, Olvis's writing determined a great degree of the character of the Swedish Reformation. If you are the guy writing all the books, then your voice will be the prominent voice molding those clergy who are going out teaching the things they have learned from your books. Uh, Olvis also translated a version of the Swedish Bible from the Vulgate, uh, with some references to Luther's translation from the Greek. In 1540, Olvis was actually uh, condemned to death because he opposed the king of Sweden's desire for complete ecclesiastical control which is to say that the king thought that if he was the king of the country, he should also be the king of the church. He wanted the, the control uh, over, uh, over the church. Olvis uh, disagreed, not only disagreed, opposed that strongly and was condemned to death, but he was later pardoned and actually died uh, on April 19th, hence the commemoration date, died April 19th, 1552. So that's uh, one of our two renewers of the church for this coming Sunday, uh, Olvis Petrie, P-E-T-R-I. And uh, let's uh, take a moment to talk about his brother, Laurinaitis. Laurinaitis returned from Wittenberg because they both had education uh, there at the University of Wittenberg. Uh, he returned from Wittenberg in 1525 at the young age of 28 and was appointed professor at the University of Uppsala, which is where 
he started his education because he began at Uppsala, went to Leipzig, and then Wittenberg. Kind of, kind of crazy to think that he graduated Wittenberg and went back and taught at his own alma mater. Um, four years after teaching there, uh, he was ordained, and then he was uh, the first evangelical uh, archbishop of Sweden who was consecrated on September 22nd, 1531. Um, evangelical uh, meaning, you know, kind of uh, for, for those of us at faith, we're members of the ELCA, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, uh, coming from that Greek word evangelion to proclaim, um, proclaim the gospel. Uh, very, very different than the way a lot of Americans use the word evangelical when talking about other, um, other denominational sects. Uh, so uh, that's that, that word evangelical there. Um, Laurinaitis lived uh, lived about, he lived 42 years beyond his consecration as the first bishop of Sweden, and he died uh, in 1573. Uh, a few other key notes as to, I mean, because you can say that, okay, we have two brothers, they are from Sweden, one was the first archbishop of Sweden, um, the other wrote a lot of the books that became the backbone of the Swedish uh, kind of uh, Reformation movement in uh, in that part of the world. Is that enough to get you a commemoration? And why are they called renewers of the church? So, A, <laughs> being Olvis, being the one who writes the, the, the text on liturgy and education that trains a generation or more of uh, of clergy, that's a great task. You know, that, that is something that should be heralded. And Laronidas, being the first arch, archbishop, you, you, can, you can only have one first, right? But along with that, in 1542, they completed the Swedish Bible. And this was the work of both brothers that were working together. So it started with the... the um, New Testament that Olvis had written, kind of borrowing, uh, or, or not borrowing, leaning on the Vulgate and on Luther's writings. And then Lauren and I just got together and the two of them did the entire Bible in Swedish cover to cover. Um, and not only that, but this was royally approved. And just, just to put things in a timeline, in 1540, Olvis was condemned to death for opposing the king because the king wanted to be the king of the country and the king of the church. And here, two years after he was condemned, uh, the brothers release this Swedish Bible, which is approved by royalty across the board, which is just amazing. Because at that point in time, this was a, a huge wave of the Reformation saying there are all these churches in Germany uh, that the only Bible there is in Greek or Latin or Greek or Latin, you know. And so the lay people could not read the text. This was a, a big thing for Martin Luther. And so here with these brothers, they are, uh, whereas Luther translated the Bible to German for the common people of Germany, these two brothers translated the entire Bible to Swedish for the, the, the common folk of Sweden. Um, and, and that, I think, tied in to Leonidas being the first archbishop and all of his, all of his writings definitely uh, deserves the commemoration and the celebration of the two of them as renewers of the church. Uh, to, to think about things in a, in a different way, during the lives of these two brothers, during their lives, Sweden as a country passed from being a place of just Danish rule to a subject of Rome to an independent nation with a firmly established church. All of that happened within the lives of these brothers. And they were part of the, uh, the, the core nucleus of that movement, from writing to being bishops to releasing the Bible, making sure that church was established strongly. And so this Sunday, April 19th, take a moment to remember all this and Laronidas Petrie, renewers of the church, um, because it is, uh, it is their commemoration day. So now, moving from Sweden, next we're gonna jump over to, uh, 
to where is modern day Italy, because this Tuesday, April 21st, is the commemoration of Anselm, the Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, Anselm was born in the year 1033, and after the death of his mother and arguments with his father, Anselm left home, and he was about 23 years old. So his mother dies, his father and him butt heads, as most 20-year-olds will with their father, and uh, he, leaves, he leaves home. He travels in Burgundy and in France, and he discovers the Benedictine Monastery of Beck, which is located in Normandy. And so he begins studying and engaging with the Benedictine life there. Eventually, when his father dies, he has left uh, all of his father's property. And Anselm has to decide whether he's going to return to Italy and take care of the property and whatever business is at hand there, or if he's going to become a monk. And he chooses to become a monk. He stays at the Benedictine Monastery of Beck, and eventually he is elected the Prior of Beck. Years after that, in 1078, he is elected abbot of the entire monastery. Which, you know, not, not bad for a guy who stumbles into a monastery to first be a prior and then end up the uh, abbot in charge of the monastery. Um, abbot then follows Lanfranc uh, first in the, the seat of power in the monastery and then as his successor. Well, let, let me take a step back. Um, when Anselm is elected prior at the Benedictine Monastery of Beck, it's a position of some power. Was, I, I, I have friends who are, are Benedictine who would probably uh, punch me if they were here and heard me refer to a prior maybe as middle management. But they're kind of middle management of the monastery. Uh, and then uh, Lanfranc uh, was the abbot of the monastery. But Lanfranc um, is elected as the Archbishop of Canterbury, which opened up his position as the abbot of the monastery. And so with Lanfranc uh, in the bishop seat, that is what allows Anselm to be elected to the abbot of the monastery. So then uh, Lanfranc eventually, uh, I believe he dies. I, I don't have that written on my notes, I apologize. But I believe he, he, he dies. Uh, and the archbishop, or he's uh, disposed because whoever was the king didn't like what he was doing. Um, Lanfranc is uh, the, the seat of power for the archbishop of Canterbury opens. And so Anselm is then elected or, or uh, bestowed that position. And so Anselm follows Lanfranc both in order of being the abbot of the monastery and then that tracked to the next step of the archbishopric of Canterbury. Uh, he's enthroned as the archbishop of Canterbury on September 25th, 1093, and then he is consecrated in that role on December 4th, 1093. Anselm struggled with the king uh, at that time over the idea of the king's ultimate authority. This sounds very similar to Jolvis that we just talked about in Sweden. See, the king wanted to, to be the source and seat of his own power. And so the king refused to acknowledge Pope Urban IV. And looking at this situation, Anselm realized that the situation was entirely hopeless. And so he left England. And at that point in time, the king took possession of the, the seat of power at Canterbury. And we, this happened more often than we would think, especially in the 11th century. You have an archbishop over, over Canterbury, like Anselm was, and the king says, I am the king, I don't need to listen to the pope, and you need to be on my side. And Anselm says, I don't know, no, I don't, I don't think I do. Uh, I'm on the side of the papacy, I'm on the side of the church, and we are God's kingdom, not your kingdom. And so the king is going to try to butt heads with the pope, which is, you know, the immovable force or the uh, unstoppable force hitting the 
unmovable object. Anselm realized that these two are just going to butt heads and just leaves, just walks away. Um, after leaving the Archbishopric of Canterbury, Anselm uh, made his way to Italy, where the Pope received him graciously and gave him a place of honor at the Council of Bari. Anselm stayed away from uh, England until after the death of William Rufus, and Rufus's successor, King Henry I, recalled Anselm back to England. But even though he was recalled back to England and he, he went back, the struggle over authority quickly renewed. And when Anselm refused to take an oath of allegiance to the crown, the king, Henry I, sent Anselm back to Rome. So we can see the politics playing out here. King Henry I is in power. He goes, no, 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 Anselm, I'm totally different. I won't put you in the same compromising situation. Anselm goes from Italy back to England. Anselm surveys the situation. Suddenly, King Henry I is asking Anselm to take an oath to the power of the king and the power of the country uh, and allegiance to the crown. And Anselm goes, nope, I left once because of this. I'll leave twice because of this. Um, goes back to Rome. In 1106, a compromise was finally reached, and Anselm returned to the Archbishopric of Canterbury uh, after this compromise was reached between the king and understanding the king's power and the pope in that relationship. So it's 1106, Anselm is once again the Archbishop of Canterbury, things are going well, and he lives until 1109. And that year, Anselm died on April 21st, which is, that's why it's his commemoration day. But that was also the Wednesday of Holy Week. So the Archbishop of Canterbury passes on the Wednesday of Holy Week. And so uh, on this Tuesday, April 21st, we'll remember Anselm for his uh, duty and his service as the Archbishop of Canterbury and also his, um, his uh, trust and his unwavering nature to stand in the face of a king and say, no, king, you, the crown may have the power over the country, but the crown does not have the power over God. And whenever the, the king and two of them, William Rufus and Henry I, pushed him too far, he just walked away. He goes, I, I don't answer to you. And he went back to Rome, you know. So that's Tuesday the 21st, a little thing to keep in mind, a good Anselm. And plus, if you want to celebrate Anselm, the Archbishop of Canterbury, pull dust off your copy of the Canterbury Tales and give those a read and to think about the connection that's there. You know, that's, that's great. That's great. So from Italy and England on Tuesday, we're going to jump to Japan on Thursday. Thursday, April 23rd. Get ready to hear me butcher a name bad. Uh, Thursday, April 23rd is the commemoration of Tohiko Kagawa, who is a renewer of society. And his uh, commemoration day is April 23rd. Um, and here's a little bit about Kagawa. Kagawa was born on July 10th, 1888 at Kobe, Japan. He was the son of a member of the Japanese cabinet and a geisha girl. So he was orphaned at four and raised by his father's wife. And it was a very unhappy situation, the way she was treated, or I'm sorry, the way he was treated, um, and, and just a very, uh, very negative situation. He, uh, he enrolled in Bible classes as a youth as a way to learn English. And when he became a Christian in his teens, he was disinherited from his family. With the help of missionaries, he studied at a Presbyterian college in Tokyo from 1905 to 1908. And from 1910 to 1924, he spent all but two years of that time in a six-foot-by-six-foot six hut 
in the slums of Kobe called Shanaqua, which are considered some of the worst slums anywhere in the world. This did not deter him, but it warmed his heart to reach out to those who were abused and those who were discarded by the system. And so in 18, I'm sorry, in 1918, Kagawa founded the Labor Federation there in Japan. In 1921, he founded a farmer's union. Uh, he was arrested during the Rice Riots of 1919 and the Shipyard Strikes of 1921, where he, success, or where he engaged to riot to raise awareness to negative working conditions for those in those fields. He worked successfully for universal male suffrage that was achieved in 1925, that all should be treated the same way and have the same rights. And he also worked tirelessly for modification of laws against trade unions. During his life, Kagawa organized the Bureau of Social Welfare he insisted upon a reorganization of the economic structure of the world to realize a Christian idea of social order. And in 1928, he founded the Anti-War League. After that, in 1930, he began the Kingdom of God movement to promote the conversion of Japan to Christianity. And as well as all of these things, the, the labor union, the farmers union, um, the Bureau of Social Welfare, the Kingdom of God movement, as well as all of this, he worked tirelessly to establish Christ, uh, credit unions, schools, hospitals, and churches in Japan. And one of the ways he did this was he visited the United States several times to gain support for all of his projects on social reform. And for all of these reasons, we remember uh, Kagawa as a reformer of society on April 23rd, which is the day that he died in Tokyo in 1960. It, it's crazy to um, look at the laundry list of this man's achievements and to how, how do you, over the course of a life, over the course of 72 years, how do you begin the seven different unions and federations, build multiple schools and churches and hospitals? Uh, though I, to, to look and to see the example set by his life is such a powerful witness. So we've had, uh, we've had three, four commemorations. If you count both of the Petrie brothers, we have Olvis, uh, Laronidas Petrie, one, two, three is Anselm, uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, and the fourth commemoration is Kagawa. However, coming up next Saturday, April 25th, we're gonna end on a festival because that is a festival of St. Mark the Evangelist. That's right, St. Mark the author, of the gospel. There are four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and this is St. Mark's. Now you may be asking yourself, well, what's the difference between a festival and a commemoration? And uh, the, the quick answer to that is that the festivals are a bigger deal. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a really quick answer to that. Uh, when we remember the Archbishop of Canterbury, that it's a good thing to commemorate him because he is a wonderful example. Um, Kagawa is a wonderful example, but festivals, you know, the festival of the uh, resurrection, the festival of St. Mark, the festival of the reformation, these are, are um, the bigger, uh, bigger deal. You know, think about it uh, as a, um, you know, you, you, I, I, the example that comes to my mind right now, and this is horrible, I hate the idea that this is what came to mind, but you know, you, you buy a, a best of, collection of, of a band or an artist on CD or cassette or, you know, whatever the case may be. And there are the songs that everybody knows that those are the big hits. And then there's the other ones that are kind of like tucked away in there. And your festivals are your, are your big hits, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, um, the naming of Jesus, the Reformation, uh, the festival of the resurrection, which is Easter, you know, the, these sorts of things. 
And so this Saturday, April 25th, is the festival of St. Mark, the evangelist. And so Mark is usually identified as John Mark, who we run across in the book of Acts. Though to simply put, Mark Q or Mark, M-A-R-C-U, is a very, very, very common Roman name. You know, it's kind of like doing, uh, if, if the evangelist were American authors and one of them's name would be John Smith. Well, there's a lot of people named John Smith, right? I, but, but it's usually identified that Mark is the same Mark uh, mentioned in the book of Acts. Uh, Mark, his mother is named Mary, and she owned a house where the infant church gathered for both prayer and the Lord's Supper. Mark uh, accompanied his cousin Barnabas and St. Paul on the first missionary journey written about in Acts. Though there was some kind of falling out uh, between Mark and Paul for some reason, and Paul refused to take Mark on his second journey. Now, later they, they reconciled, but it's probably good because Mark probably had other stuff to do. Um, like, write his gospel, <laughs> you know? Um, Mark's gospel is thought to be the earliest of the four, of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And ancient writers believed, some ancient writers, I should say, some ancient writers believed that St. Mark was actually an interpreter of St. Peter from who he got much of the material in his gospel. So when people ask the question, well, where did the gospel writers get their information? Was it all firsthand or did they hear it from other people? Some ancient writers believed that Mark's account, his gospel, was a combination of both he, he, what he had experienced and also what he got from St. Peter. Now, according to one unsupported tradition, Mark was the first bishop of Alexandria and he was martyred there in the year 64 AD. In 829 AD, Mark's supposed remains, the ones at Alexandria, were moved from Alexandria to Venice and the famous, or in the famous cathedral there. And ever since the 9th century, that's the 800s, April 25th, for those of us in the Western Christian Church, we have kept this date, or that date, I should say, we have, <laughs> I'm sorry, the, the grammar on that was horrible. Um, ever since the ninth century, uh, those of us in Western Christian Christendom have considered April 25th to be the commemoration and festival of St. Mark. Um, yeah. So there we go. There's St. Mark. Uh, so when uh, when you sit down and look at your calendar uh, this Sunday, you can pull out that pencil and on Sunday, remember the Petrie brothers. On Tuesday, remember Anselm, the Archbishop of Canterbury. On Thursday, remember uh, Tohiko Kagawa, renewer of society. And then on next Saturday, uh, St. Mark the Evangelist. And again, I uh, to listen to these little bio sketches is interesting and it, it's fun for what it is but it's also really powerful to realize that their story is our story too. Because the things that we have in common is faithfulness, discipleship, and following our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As always, thank you for joining us here on Adult Forum. This episode has been about festivals and commemorations. I hope everybody is staying safe um, out in the world as it is. And remember, as always, God loves you very, very much.